All right, fantastic. Hey, it's good to see all of you today, and uh, and welcome to our service. Welcome everybody who's watching at home. Also, hey, a couple of things to uh, to to tell you about. A lot of things uh, coming up. So, main thing that I want to bring just to your attention, so you know about it, is is jamboree. Right that that begins Thursday. And, uh, and, and it is one of the biggest things we do, obviously. So it has tons of folks that come. And so, uh, but there's a couple of free kids events I want to tell you about. The first one you'll see some, uh, some video or some pictures behind me is uh, Kids Blitz. And um, it's kind of a high energy, crazy time. Uh, it, it's like a Nickelodeon type type thing, I believe it is. But it is really pretty cool, and it's free, and so uh, you can you can bring your kids, you kids and parents. You can invite folks to it. Uh, it just really is a it's a cool thing, and so uh, so anyway, so we we we've had a great response to it last year, and and uh, both children and parents come to know Christ by coming to the kids' blood. So it's just a neat thing. So uh, so if you'd like to uh, if like to be a part of that, that's at six o'clock on Friday. Six o'clock on Friday. Uh, on five o'clock on Saturday, Jack Hartman's back. Okay, so yeah, we've got a few few fans. All right, uh, preschool and families, right? You will love him, right? Uh, and teachers, especially teachers. So it just is a it's just a cool time. Wanted to tell you about that. Um, Christmas market, right? Christmas market will be Saturday from 11 to 5. And to remember, too, uh, I don't know if this affects many folks in here, but just so you know, we don't have Saturday night service this coming weekend, uh, but, that, but that country band, God's Country, will be doing an outdoor concert on that same time frame on Saturday night. So anyway, lots going on, lots happening. And uh, really, one other quick thing um, is Trunk or Treat is tonight. Uh, it is, there's going to be huge numbers of folks that come. Uh, and so, um, uh, so anyway, so I, I, I just would encourage you, you can come, obviously, bring your kids, uh, bring your grandkids, bring, uh, bring friends, bring, it's, it's one of those events you can really bring anybody to. But if you don't have kids, uh, then please still come because we have, other than maybe Jamboree and maybe our Christmas musical, we have more people. Uh, at our church from our community at Trunk or Treat, right? So uh, if you want to just come out and just make the people feel welcome, you know, if you've got that personality, you know, you can, uh, you can do that, then, uh, then it would be a great time. You can come from six to eight uh, tonight. The last thing I want to tell you, all right, sounds like the commercial hour, but the uh, last thing I want to tell you about is, and I will share with you this again next week, is that, and I try to sh- uh, share with you every couple of years, it's just how important it is to vote, right? Um, I here at the church, we're not gonna, never going to tell you who to vote for, uh, and, but we will we, we'll tell you to vote. And, uh, and so uh, I don't get all into the endorsing and all those things, but I do, I do realize the incredible importance uh, to vote. You happen to live, um, you happen to live in a country uh, where you get a voice in those who will lead over you. That just is almost unheard of in human history. And so, uh, so, so find out, right? All right, uh, find out and uh, issues that are going on and, uh, and, uh, and basically find the one who, um, who, who best fits and who you think that will, will help us in a lot of the issues we do have. So, uh, so anyway, so I wanted to tell you, wanted to tell you that. Uh, don't not vote because you can't find the perfect candidate because there is, there is no such thing as the perfect candidate any more than there's the, there's the perfect pastor, right? It just doesn't happen. So uh, anyway, all right, let's continue. All right, I'd like to, I'd like to kick, uh, kick this morning off. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to John 15. That's where we're going to be. I, um, I am I'm excited about today. Uh, because it's it's going to one thing I just love being politically incorrect. It just is a it's just a favorite of mine. But I just but another in in very important thought here is that I'm going to share a lot of scriptures with you, right? But I want to get your mind into the context of it because perhaps some of these verses 
uh, when you just read them casually, they don't make any sense. But when you see what they're saying, I just, just let them speak is my thought today. Just put a whole lot of them up there and let them speak. In case you haven't been here, oh, by the way, let's go ahead and jump into this and, uh, and I'll do you a recap. I think uh, I think about, found a better way to do this recap is just to read the, the verses. I'll read them in just a minute. Today's title is, is uh, Judgment and Glory right? Judgment and glory. You'll see why we title it that in just a moment. And, uh, and, and in this passage in John chapter 15, it's the passage with, uh, with Jesus talking about, I'm the vine, you're the branches, right? And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an agricultural analogy or metaphor or illustration, example, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and Jesus used common day things so that people could understand. And so, but there's, there's certain parts to this. Uh, there's the, uh, but, but we get to the judgment. You know, judgment is a, you know, judgment and glory. We won't get to this part till the very end. Uh, but the judgment part is what most people don't want to hear about. They don't want to talk about. But I want you to know that it is a common fear or whatever you want to call it, that for most people, uh, that there will be one day that we'll have to give an account for ourselves. And that scares folks, right? Especially if the person who you have to give an account to knows everything you've ever done or said or thought, right? So it's a scary thing. That's why people avoid the issue altogether, right? Uh, and so... But I just want you to know what the scripture says. And it, and, it, and it was brought up in these verses, eight verses, the eight verses that we've been talking about for the last eight weeks, nine weeks. There's so much packed into these eight verses that Jesus talked about. And uh, I'll share with you in, in a minute what, what all we've been talking about. But there's this one, really one verse uh, that is in this, that talks about, uh, about the judgment that's to come. And there's always been this analogy, and it's only mentioned. The main part of, of John 15 is, is abide. And we'll finish that up with that next week. But abide, and what does it mean to abide? And again, we'll talk about all this in a minute. But this, this whole thought of judgment, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's not a, the word judgment is not a good word or a bad word, it's just a word. Uh, judgment is basically, I mean, I used to have a school teacher, had a lot of them, but one that used it all the time. Uh, I used to have a school teacher that always called test day or exam judgment day. And, <laughs> and what that means is, is that the teacher was going to find out if you learned anything. Now, if you're prepared, judgment day is not a big deal. But boy, if you're not prepared, then judgment day is a day you don't want to be a part of, right? In fact, we've gotten so much in our culture that most people uh, have kind of rewritten what the scripture says in their own mind and, uh, and basically don't believe there is going to be any kind of a judgment. But you know, I think innately, the way that God created us, I think we know that. I even have lost people tell me sometimes, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be him when you have to give an account. And I always want to think, well, you don't even... And yet you know, in, you know inside that that's going to happen. Anyway, so, so what I'd like to go ahead and jump into it real quick is what will be the judgment criteria? Number one then is the judgment itself. And then, and then I'll get into all of what's going to happen, what's, what we've been talking about. So I wanna go ahead and get into this so we can tell you how we got to where we got today, all right? But the judgment, the judgment. What will be the judgment in the analogy in John chapter 15? Well, the judgment is going to be just basically this, uh, fruit or no fruit, right? That's, that is the judgment. There's either fruit or there's no fruit in this analogy. And you're like, Jeff, this is my first time. I'm not following. Okay, let's jump into it and let you, and then kind of catch you up on everything we've been talking about. All right, John chapter 15, verse one, it says this. Jesus says, and this is this analogy of, of basically of growing grapes, right? Growing grapes, because, because these were not figs or olives, because those were trees. 
So it's a vine, so it, it, it's more than likely it's grapes. So Jesus used this because they understood this thought. So I'm the vine, Jesus said, and my father is the vine dresser, or he's the gardener, he's the farmer, he's the one that takes care of, of, of the grapes, of the vines, all right? And he goes on to say that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts it away, he takes it away. So we will talk about that in a minute. But the, but the branches, you'll find out in just a minute, we're the branches in this analogy. So really the only criteria is, is there fruit or is there not fruit? Right, here we go. So every branch that does not bear fruit, he cuts it away. And every branch that he does, bear, that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that we, be, we may bear more fruit. So this is this picture of God at work in our lives. And, and this is a pretty cool picture of, of God the Father actively at work. Therefore, if there's no fruit, it, it's, it's cut off. If there is fruit, then it's pruned. And so we've even talked about the pruning process. Not always pleasant, discipline, right? Training. Those are not fun things, but they're the things that make you better. Really can make you your best, all right? So God's at work in our life, so you have that. And again, all of these things we've been talking about over the last weeks, right? The main thing I want to talk to you about today is this judgment and glory type aspect, all right? So... But also remember uh, that bear fruit, right? Bear fruit, bear more fruit, and then bear much fruit. So you have this progression of, of growing in your faith where you, you, the immature will produce fruit, but it will be immature. But as it grows, it will produce more, and then eventually it will bear much. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Let me throw this out to you. See the word clean, clean. That's going to come back up at the very end. But remember the picture of clean and unclean. Remember the analogies in the Old Testament of food and animals that were kosher and those that weren't. Clean, those were clean animals and those that were unclean. And that we wouldn't eat the ones that were unclean, or at least the Jewish people. In fact, a, a practice they still, many of them, practice still to this day. But what does that even mean? Well, it'll begin to make sense to you because in this passage, it talks about it. You've been clean because of the word I've spoken to you. In other words, you're mine, right? You've been, you're, you're his. Anyway, verse four, abide in me and I in you. Now the word abide, we're gonna talk more about that next week. Guys, it is the only command you've been given. You're not gonna be held accountable for for doing great things for God. I hear people say that sometimes. I think I've even said that at times. But I found that my only command is just to abide. We talked about that a few weeks ago. We spent two weeks on it. We're gonna talk about it again as we finish this series. Because guys, that's the main thing. How he works, you know, we used last week the potter and the clay, right? The refiner's fire and the ore, right? And, and we looked at all those, the, the runner and the, and the guy and the person who trains him, right? So all of these are metaphors, right? Same here, the pruning kind. They're metaphors of, of him at work in your life, right, helping you to grow. But the, the thought here, the only really command we've been shared is to abide. Abide in me, Jesus said, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So then you have this, we, again, we, these are all things, these are just review. I have to take this time to get your mind back in the spot of, of this whole concept. Because the whole thought of judgment, right, is it freaks people out until you see it. Boy, that is what that says, you know? And I love doing that. I love, I love when it is not not, Jeff, about what you think or about, you know, it's, it's what it says, all right? So you'll see that today, but I need to get your mind there and back where we were. So uh, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So you can't go out and do great things for him. All he's called you to do is abide in him, and then he'll do great things through you. And in the end, he'll get the glory for it. It's actually pretty cool when you look at it, all right? I'm the vine, you're the branches, whoever... All right, here we go. The branches, whoever abides in me and I in him, he bears, I've already, move on, verse six. 
There you go. Good for you. All right. If anyone does not abide in me, uh, he is cut off, we found out out there earlier, thrown away like a branch, and he withers. Okay, and then withers, and then the, ba- the branches are gathered, and then they're thrown into the fire and, and burned. Okay, so in this analogy is that he's making this judgment call. Fruit, no fruit. No fruit, then I chop it off. It falls to the ground and it withers. And then when it withers, it's all gathered and it's, it's burned, thrown in the fire and burned. This is, a, this is a common example or a common thing that Jesus taught about, about final punishment, right? It just is, right? And it is, it's straightforward, right? Because what does this word wither here mean? Well, let me tell you, let me give you a great example of the word wither, right? I do not dye my hair white. When I got here 15 years ago, it was blonde, all right? So I have been withering ever since. <laughs> Does everybody understand the word wither? Uh, you call it decay, you call it going downhill, you call it whatever, nobody wants to talk about it, but it is the truth. It's the elephant in the room nobody wants to acknowledge, right? And we've, when we fight all we can to keep it from happening. But remember this, it is, it is going to happen. So eventually, there's going to be a withering and there's going to be a gathering. Just remember these words, because when we begin to read these other things, you'll begin to see all of them match up. It's really cool, all right? So just hang with me here. So anyway, so and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it's going to be done. By this, my Father is glorified. So hence you understand where we got uh, judgment and glory. And what does this mean? And you'll see it mentioned often, right? What it means to bring glory to, to, to someone, to praise someone. And it's usually those who have identified in their lives what God has done in their lives. And the way that God gets the most glory in your life, right, is that you bear much fruit. That is the only things he can do through you. And the only way you're gonna do that is if you abide. Powerful stuff. So this is where we've been up to now. So back to number one. Well, back where we've been the whole time. We, first of all, I want, you to, I, want you to see, I want you to see judgment. What is the judgment? The judgment is whether there's fruit or no fruit. And the scriptures talk about this often. And so I want you to look in a couple other spots, mainly parables, where Jesus talked about this. And it's first one I want to share with you is found in John, I mean, excuse me, Matthew 13. All right, Matthew 13. Now, remember, these are just parables. These are just stories that Jesus told. But I want you to see that most of what I'm going to share with you, except till the very end, these are all Jesus' words. He spoke about this kind of thing often. And he illustrated it. He allegorized it. Right? And, and he, he just, and, but it all is congruent. It all matches up. And so, I have to not talk to you about it as much and just let you see it, right? Matthew chapter 13, verse one. Uh, That same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat beside the sea, that is the Sea of Galilee. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a, a, a boat and sat down and he pushed out and then they stayed on the shore and he was able to talk to them, to teach them. And so the whole crowd stood on the beach, right? And he told them many things in parables, stories that have kind of an underlying meaning to them. Symbolism, allegories, parables, whatever you want to call it. All right. Now this one is well known and I, there's no way I can tell you all about it. I just want you to see what is the criteria. Here we go. Uh, and then he said, a sower went out to sow. Basically, a farmer went out to plant seed is the thought that we would understand better. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it immediately sprung up uh, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, uh, they were scorched, 
And since they had no root, they withered away. Don't miss this. All right? For those of you who have ears to hear and are following along with me, and you see these similar words that Jesus used to say similar things, right? In, in, over different allegories, different, uh, different analogies, and different parables. It's actually pretty amazing, right? Uh, other seeds fell among the thorns, and, uh, and the thorns grew up, and they choked them, right? Other seeds fell on good soil, and they produced grain, some 100, some 60, some 30. And then Jesus makes this wonderful statement that I repeat as often as I can. Those of you that have ears to hear, you need to hear this. It is still one of the great mysteries, you know, just with this message. Uh, the last, twice I've done it and now, now, and I've had people come to me and, and, and it was like, wow, Jeff, that was, that was so, that was so important to me to understand. And, and they patted their heart and I'm like to myself, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing to me and what Jesus meant when he says, those who have ears to hear. I mean, he's talking a story about a guy going out and planting seed on, on, on paths and among thorns. And, and, and what does he even talk about? What does it even mean? Well, he explains it in just a minute. But the ears to hear, that, that, has, been, that has been the incredible thing in doing what I do. Uh, that's why I found that those who want to know will know. And, um, and those that don't have the ears to hear won't. It just, and I don't know how that works. Right? But anyway, and so basically his disciples came to him and said, Jesus, you're talking to these people about all this stuff. What does it mean? And Jesus told them the meaning. All right, let's take a look at it. Here is the parable of the sower. Right? Look what Jesus said. He says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. So Jesus lets you in on a lot. The soil represents someone's heart, right? Uh, the, the seed is God's word, right? And it plants on a heart. So really a lot of this, which we don't have time to talk about it, it has to do with the condition of someone's heart the receptivity of someone's heart. Some, uh, some again, and there are four types here. There's the, there's the hard, right? And that's this one. Uh, the, here's the word of the kingdom and does not understand. The evil one comes and snatches away, which has been planted in his heart. That was what was sown along the path. So the path is, surrounds it, and it's hard. Because people are walking on it, carts are being pulled over it, so it's packed down, so the seed just sits on top, never gets anywhere. So that's more of a hard-hearted person. And then he goes on to say, and then there was some planted on rocky ground. This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root, but endures for a while, and when tribulation persecution rises, it falls away. So notice here, this is someone who who hears God's word, and at first they're kind of excited about it, you know? I always like to, I always call it, they have a religious spasm, you know, and they get real excited about stuff, but then it's not real, it's just emotional. So when the emotions goes away, then, then again, it wasn't, it wasn't it. Well, Jeff, how do you tell? How can you tell if it's real, okay? It's all about fruit, guys. The scripture talks about it over and over and over and over again. And so, obviously, this shallow soil springs up, excited, but then falls away. Never produces fruit, which is what, anyway, let's continue on. Uh, for what was sown along among the thorns, this is the person who hears God's word and the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, uh, choke the word, and it proves what? This is crowd participation time. And it proves what? Unfruitful. So there's our, our, our picture of what Jesus is teaching and sharing with us. But then, right, that which is sown on good soil. I always like to say that good soil, you follow me? That which is sown on good soil, remember this, that good soil is prepared, right? It's receptive. It's a desire to know. You know, have you ever thought about why the Bible talks about if you seek him, you'll find him? 
That's the appropriate type heart. I don't know, but I want to know. Well, God says you're going to. If you want to know and you'll seek him, he'll let you, he'll let you find out. I don't know, it's really pretty interesting. It's pretty amazing when you see all of it. But I think it's interesting here too. Uh, it's good soul is the one who hears the word and understands it. And he indeed, what does he do? He bears fruit and yields. And in one case, it's 100, another it's 60, and another it's 30. So there's this progression, right? Bear fruit, bear more fruit, bear much fruit. And you have the same progression here. You never know how or what God's going to do and all those things. But I will tell you this is that fruit produced in a person's life is the evidence that you're his. Has nothing to do with going to church, has nothing to do with being a part of this denomination or that denomination. It has nothing to do with baptism, whether it's when you were a, a baby or, 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 or now. It ha now it's a picture, but it is not what makes you his. Right? Well, I try to do good things. That's not what we're talking about. You'll see, even see that in a minute. The question is, do you abide? It's not a one-time decision, it's a life. And then he produced fruit, even to the thought of born again, which again, we'll talk about in a minute. That is a picture of, of a fruit being produced. It's, it's an incredible thing when you really begin to understand what, it, what the real judgment here is, is the judgment, is there fruit or is there not? Right? Now, one other parable I wanna share with you. It's, it's the one right after this one. And this one is really interesting right? Again, hang with me here as Jesus reveals a whole lot of things that match up with other parts of the scriptures. All right, here we go. Verse 24. Uh, and he put another parable for them saying, the kingdom of heaven uh, may be compared uh, to a man who planted good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So what, weeds, what do you mean so weeds? Well, I like some of the older translations here because weed for us, weeds is just such a generic term. It can mean all kinds of stuff, right? In reality, the term is tear. It's a particular kind of weed. All right, here we go. So you have, you have, you have wheat. This is what we're talking about here. And it grows up and the tear that has been sown, it grows up and they look the exact same growing up. I, again, being from where I'm from, I, we have some family land in Tennessee and, and, and if you leave a field, there, there is this wheat stuff that grows. It's not wheat, right? If y'all know what I'm talking about, it, it, it's not wheat. It looks like wheat when it grows, but the only fruit it has are those little cottony things that blow in the wind. If, if you know which one I'm talking about. And, and, and they, they get in your nose and they make you sneeze. And it's just, what if you don't have, Jeff, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, they look exactly like wheat when they're growing up. But the difference between the two is that one bears fruit and one does not. Don't miss what he's talking about here. So I'm gonna read the rest of this quickly and get to Jesus's explanation. Here we go. Uh, so he sowed weeds, right? And look at verse 26. It says here, so when the plants came up and they bore grain, they produced fruit, all right? Uh, then the weeds, they appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came to him and said, Master, boy, you did, didn't, you plant, uh, didn't you plant good seed in your field? Uh, how is it then that we have all of these weeds, all these tares? And he said to them, well, an enemy has done this. And uh, so the servants told him, hey, you want us to go out and you want us to pull the weeds up? And he says, no, 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 no. Less gathering the weeds, right? That you may root up the weed along with them. Let them grow up together until the harvest, right? Until the harvest. And then I will tell the reapers, right? Reapers are just harvesters, okay? Okay. But this is where you get some of your superstition, you know, the grim reaper, you know, with the, with the sickle. Have you ever wanted to know why? Because they're gathering the wheat, right? And most people have no idea that that's what it is on Halloween, right? They have no idea. But it, it is the, what they call the grim reaper. But in reality, it's just a harvester. It's just 
someone you employ to go out and, uh, and pick the crop or to bring in the crop that's been planted. It's really pretty interesting. Anyway, hang with me here. Here we go. So, uh, tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my, into my barn. Now, let's listen to Jesus' explanation of this parable. This one's really pretty cool. Look at verse uh, 36. Then he left the crowds and went to this house, and his disciples came to him and said, hey, can you tell us, can you explain to us what the parable of the weeds <laughs> is, right? And he answered, and he goes on, here's what Jesus said. Well, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, that is Jesus, in this analogy. The field is the world, right? And the weeds are the son of the evil one. Whom the enemy has sowed them is, is the devil himself, Jesus' words. The harvest is the end of the age. That is that time when the separation begins, when the distinguishing begins, right? And the reapers are the angels. Again, I just, if you've never just taken the time just to stop and go, ah, oh, okay. I always thought the Grim Reaper was the guy in the hat with the sickle, you know? But that's, that's, that's in sincerity. That's where, again, all the superstitions come from. But when you see Jesus' analogy, he's just trying to share with you, there's only one criteria in this judgment at the harvest. You either have fruit or you don't. All right? Does everybody hear me? I don't want to say you agree with me, but do you hear me? All right? You either have fruit or you don't. And you have fruit if you abide in him. If you don't abide in him, you don't have any. It's just an incredible thing. What does it mean to abide? That is the most important thing. That's what we're gonna finish up with next week. What does it mean to abide? All right, let's listen to the rest of Jesus' explanation. All right? He says, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. So you have this, this, this really tough look of this, burning, right? Destroyed, I don't know what you want to call it, but it is what it says, right? Uh, so let's see what else he says. Gather and burn with fire so it will be at the end of the age. Look at verse 41. The Son of Man, Jesus, will send his angels, the reapers, and they will gather out of the kingdoms everybody. So it's the same concept of going out and, 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 and harvesting the wheat in the field, which represents the world in Jesus' little analogy. And the distinguisher is the fruit. That's why I tell you guys, the fruit, that is the judgment call. That is what's judgment. They either have fruit or they don't, right? And so he goes on to say, and then gather out of the kingdom all, of, uh, all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. There's a big place where there'll be weeping, gnashing of teeth. And you know, it's an interesting thing, you know, here's the thought. You know, I don't, I don't know, Jeff, what do you think that'll be like? What is that? I, I don't have any idea, I really don't, other than what, just what the scripture says. Because I've watched people through the years let their imaginations go wild, that's where you come up with Grim Reaper kind of stuff, right? But just for what it says, and I can't tell you how many people that through this, this is not a politically correct thing, right? Oh, which I, I couldn't care less, but I do want you to hear this, all right? I've had people tell me through the years, well, I don't believe that. All right, let me ask you a question. Right. That, that question, I don't believe that, it doesn't matter. The greater question that you should ask yourself is, is it true? That is the question, is it true? Because truth is truth, whether you believe it or not. But see, we're, we've gotten arrogant, and I'm not saying you guys, but our, our culture and the whole political thing, we've gotten so arrogant that we think that because we believe it to be true, that makes it true for us. Again, that's something that you have to deal with yourself, but I have learned that especially these past few weeks with this election going on in you, and you listen to people spout this stuff. And 
Well, I believe it to be the truth. Well, it doesn't matter what you believe. Is it the truth? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Is it the truth? In fact, but we have this weird thing. But I have just found that this is what Jesus said. Right? This is what Jesus said. And, and, and so the greatest question is, is it, is it the truth? And I believe that it is. It's what he's teaching. Right? And again, well, Jeff, that's your interpretation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell me how else you're going to uh, interpret that. And that's why, guys, that's why I, I have this dumb thing up here. It's not a dumb thing. Thank you guys for getting it for me. But <laughs> that's why I have this dumb thing up here. Because, oh, Jeff, I don't believe what you're saying is true. Well, is that what it says? That's what it says. And you have this harvest in this picture. And it's... And it basically goes on to say, you know, the, the fiery furnace is that, and then the, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He, if you have ears to hear, you need to hear this, right? All right, number one then is the fruit, is the, is the judgment. The judgment is, is there fruit or not? Number two, the results, real easy. All right, uh, if, you, if there's no fruit, then you'll be cut off. If there is fruit, then there's gonna be pruning in your life. We talked about that, all right? All right, there's gonna be pruning in your life. We talked about the last two weeks, all right? Again, I just want you to see now how it all fits together. Look at John 15, one. I'm the true vine, all right? And my father's the vine dresser. Uh, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts it off, he takes it away. But everyone that does bear fruit, he prunes. That he may bear more fruit. Verse six, if anyone does not abide in me, uh, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, we've already talked about that, right? Uh, number, uh, number three is the reward. This is where I'll close today, but I do, since I've taken enough time and I've got this, this if you've been listening, right? I've got you in this thought of what the scripture says about this stuff. So I wanna read to you some real strong verses that are, perhaps you've read before that never made real sense to you. But if you understand what we're talking about, it's like, wow, that is what that says. So hang with me here when we talk about uh, reward or whatever you want to talk about. In reality, the reward is, is you know, judgment and glory. Because the greatest reward to those of you, you and I who are truly his, the greatest reward we'll ever have is bringing him, him glory through, through us. That's, that's our greatest purpose. And if you're truly his, especially if you've grown in your faith, that is the absolute thing you end up with. Lord, I just want my life to make a difference for you. I mean, that's just where you get to. This self-centered egomaniac type stuff, this is not who he's called you to be, right? You'll see this in a, in a minute, an amazing thing. So, all right, reward. So basically... Thrown away, uh, the reward, thrown away like a branch. We've already read this, withers and the branches are gathered and they're burned. By this is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So glorified. God receives the most glory through us than when he does the most and we, when he produces the most fruit through us. Now, Matthew chapter 25. Now, these are in times kind of verses that Jesus talked about. So now that we're in this understanding of, of harvest and separation and all of this stuff, it's, it's really pretty cool. All right, now, 25 verse 31. Hang with me here. Right, here we go. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, I'd love, again, today's title is Judgment Glory. I'd love to stay here with just not enough time. All right, here we go. Uh, and all the angels with him. Now, what are they, what are, what are they coming with? They're the, the picture of being the harvesters. All right. So he, he's starting to share with it. Now you understand, oh, from the parables and looking at, that's what he's talking about. Here we go. And he would sit on a glorious throne. And I would, again, maybe we need to come back one time and, and talk about that glory, glory, judgment and glory. But anyway, uh, verse 32, before him uh, will be gathered all the nations. All right, so you have this harvesting of everyone, all the nations. And he will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. 
Now, this isn't fruit and no fruit. This is clean and unclean for if you have ears to hear. This is what I told you at the very beginning, right? Is that you've been made clean. What's he talking about clean? What's he talking about kosher food and non-kosher food? What, is, what do all these things, well, they're all pictures. Is that those of you who are his, you aren't clean, you've been made that way. That's what you hear, you've been made new, you've been made clean. Uh, Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow, that kind of stuff that has talked about all through the scriptures. Well, now you have this incredible picture of this shepherd who all of the goats and the sheep grow up together, but in the end, they're separated into the, the clean, because the sheep is clean, and goat is not which if you wanna know the superstition of a lot of the Satanistic type stuff that has goats and goats heads, here's where you get it, right? I'm telling you guys, there's more superstition out there that comes from all of these things than you can imagine, all right? And so he's gonna put the sheep, he's gonna place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those who are on his right, that is the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Right? And then, he, and then he starts talking about, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to, to comfort me. So you have this, and then the righteous will answer him, what are you talking about? I love this. The righteous will answer him. Question. Please don't answer this out loud. But how many of you in the room, please don't answer this out loud, feel like that you are righteous in and of yourself? No, you've been made that way because of what Christ did for you at the cross. That is what he did for you. He made you righteous. You weren't righteous. That's why the book of Romans is, the whole book's written about this, what they call imputed righteousness. That is, it's a righteousness that's been given to you by grace, not one that you've earned. And anybody who's truly his knows it's not about their own goodness. It's about his goodness in us. Again, if you have ears to hear, this is gonna make perfect sense, right? And so he goes on to say, when did we see you hungry and thirsty and as a stranger and welcome you and naked and clothe you and sick? And then Jesus makes this great statement. Uh, you, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. And so these are some of the most misunderstood verses, misquoted. Even politicians use these. It's usually to raise money. I mean, just being honest, let's just throw it out there, what it's saying but what is it really saying? I mean, seriously, what's the context here? Well, you have sheep and goats. You have those who have been made clean, those who are not. And one of the great characteristics, if you are his today, it's one of the ways I have found that you can really tell if somebody is not only a believer, but they're really a growing and mature believer, is that you will have a growing sense inside of you of truly caring for other people. Not just when it benefits you, not just when people notice it, but why? Because of what Christ did for you. And so as you grow in him, as you abide in him, that being less of, you know, consumed by your own ego becomes less and less and less. Why? Because you're abiding in him and that's who he was. So this is what we're talking about here, right? And again, it's not talking specifically, it's the genuine thought is, is helping people in need. I mean, it just ought to be who you are, and that's gonna look different for everybody, right? It's amazing how it works. Then he goes on to say, then he said to those who were on the left, right, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire, prepared for his devil and his angels. Again, eternal fire, that's just, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, Jeff, what does that mean? I said, I, said, I really, I don't know uh, any more than I know the other and what it says about, you know, the, his kingdom and all the things. 
But you know, a guy, it was groundbreaking, I think. It was very simplistic, but it was groundbreaking. A guy wrote a, a song in 2000, 2001. And to me, it was one of those, it was just one of those great things. And he, and mo most of you know it, 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 the title of it, I can only imagine. And he says, I don't know. I don't know what, it's, what these things are like, but I can, I can only imagine. What's it really going to be like, look like? Again, we don't know. All I know is this, there is a real difference between the two. <laughs> and that it all has to do with that which is his and that which is not. That which has fruit and that which does not. Because without me, you can do nothing, the scripture teaches. It is a powerful thing to think about. I have to close. <sighs> but the last thing I want to talk to you about is found in 1 Peter. All right, 1 Peter. And it's just another one of these end time kind of things, this this Christ returns with his angels, the harvest kind of a feel. Uh, again, so many times songs and, and, and other things have, have, have made it almost superstitious. But Jesus was really clear. Um, uh, not, not, not the complete picture. That won't ever be. But it was pretty clear that this is, again, this is, this is, this is the truth. It's the coming time. And isn't it interesting that nobody talks about it? Nobody talks about it. Who, who would even consider themselves believers? Why? Because, well, I don't want to turn people off. Well, let me, let me say, is it the truth or not? I don't know if it turns you off or not. You know, it, if there's not this, then what did Jesus come to die for? Right? Why did he do what he did if none of this is true? It's an incredible thing. It's, it's compelling. Right? First Peter 1, this is where I'll close. First Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. That term born again is used several times in the scriptures. Most of the time people say, well, that's not in the Bible. I'm like, have you read the Bible? Um, you know, there's this one in First Peter. There's one in First John. There's also the Jesus said it in John chapter 3. All right? But this whole, again, it's about bearing fruit, right? You know, you have, you have conception, you have gestation, and then you have birth. That is, fruit is born. It's, it's a powerful thing when you look at it. But it, it's just another, you know, illustration. Anyway, uh, born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Now, there is one thing I can, I can tell you about what, if you will, heaven, right, uh, will be alike, right, a little bit. Well, these are real interesting words, um, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. See, all you and I know is wither away, right? Now, some of you may not be old enough to know to know what that looks like, all right? Just look at me, all right? Uh, all these things are true of this life. Perishable, uh, decay, defile, which is the same concept, and to fade. That's why when you buy your car, right? All right, basically it's just premature junk. <laughs> the, is, I don't think anybody disagrees, right? I mean, literally in 10 years, it, you know, you'll be longing to get rid of it, you know, as you're having to fix it every other week. So why? Because things go downhill. One thing I do know is that that, there w that that will be done away with. That's subject to decay. That's actually pretty cool when you think about it. Right. So kept in heaven for you. And who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. So it has not been re totally revealed, which I think is pretty interesting. In this you rejoice, though for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So that the, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes through, though it is tested by fire. So we're back to the analogy of the refiner's fire. We talked about this last week. Potter and the clay, right? Athlete and the trainer. You know, you, you have all these great pictures of what this means. Right? Though you have not seen him, you love him, though you do uh, not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice, all right, with joy that is inexpressible and filled with, 
There's our word again. Oh, glory, that is glory for, for, for who he is, right? The reflection of, of what he is doing in our life. It's just wonderful. Uh, obtaining the outcome of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. So when I close, as I close today, here's, here's the key thing to remember. But I wanted to, I wanted to broach this, is that there is a day of an accountability. And everybody kind of knows it. Um, if, if, if you don't believe that and say that's not true, okay, fine. But I'd just like to share with you what it says and what Jesus himself said. You see, this is why we talk about this, guys. Either Jesus was who he says he was, or he was nuts, <laughs> if you understand what I'm talking about. I mean, there's no he was a great teacher. He was a great moral leader. No, 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 no. If he wasn't who he says he was, read his stuff. He's nuts, right? And just in what I've come to understand and what he's done in my life, um, I just know who he is, right? And I know what the scripture says about him. It's just an incredible thing. So as I close, if there's never been a time in your life you've trusted him, we're gonna talk more about this, what it means to abide next week. But if you'd like to know today, there will always be some people up here that would be love to talk to you about what the scripture says. Not what they say, but what the scripture says. And so it is, again, one of these, again, we've been talking eight weeks on these eight verses. And it just, it, it's amazing what comes out of them. All right. God bless you guys. Let's have a word of prayer. And then uh, I think we're going to close with the song. And uh, I think Mish is going to close this too. So let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for a great day. God, thank you for your incredible love for us. Thank you for the gift that you gave us when you gave us your son. And so, Lord, I pray for those who have ears to hear. Lord, let them hear what your word said to them today. And God, we're going to give you the glory for it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.